right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. I uh, hope you're having a good uh, conference. Uh, before we begin, uh, we'll be sharing a lot of links, uh, but don't worry. Uh, you'll, you'll find them on, on the YouTube page whenever the recording goes up. Um, OK, let's start then. Uh, my name is Ricardo, and together with Quarantine, uh, uh, I will be talking about the future of 3D graphics on the web. Uh, but bef before we do that, uh, let's have a quick look at the past and the present. Uh, WebGL landed in browsers in uh, February uh, 2011. Uh, that was in Chrome 9 and Firefox 4, uh, were the first ones. Uh, those, browsers, those browsers were the first ones to implement it. Uh, back then, uh, the Google, with the Google Creative Lab, uh, we created an interactive music video that aimed to showcase uh, the new powers the technology was bringing to the web. It was a pretty big project in between creators, directors, uh, concept artists, uh, animators. Uh, around 100 people uh, work on the, on the project for half a year. Uh, and 10 of us were uh, JavaScript graphics developers. Uh, we knew the workflow and tools were very different compared to traditional web development. Uh, so we also made the project open source uh, so others uh, could use it as, as reference. Uh, some years later, Internet Explorer uh, and Edge and Safari implemented WebGL2, uh, which means that today the same experience uh, works in all major browsers, uh, in desktops and tablets and phones too. Uh, what I found most remarkable is the fact that we didn't have to modify the code uh, for that to happen. Uh, anyone, anyone with experience doing uh, graphics programming like, knows that this is, this is rarely the case. Uh, usually, we had to recompile the project uh, every, uh, every couple of years when operating systems update uh, or like, new devices appear. Uh, so as a quick recap, just double checking. Uh, WebGL is a JavaScript API that uh, provides binding to OpenGL. Uh, it allows web developers to utilize the uh, user's, graphics, graf user's graphics card uh, in order to create uh, efficient and performant uh, graphics uh, on the web. It is a low-level API, which means that it is very powerful, but it's also very verbose. Uh, for example, a graphics card's main primitive is a, is a triangle. Everything is done with triangles. Uh, here's the code that we're going to need to write uh, in, order, in order to display uh, just, just one triangle. Uh, first, we need to create a canvas element. Uh, then with JavaScript, we get the context uh, for that canvas. And then things, things get pretty complicated like pretty fast. Like After defining positions for each vertex, we have to add them to a buffer, send it to the GPU, then link, link the vertex and fragment shaders, compile a program that will, use, will be used to inform the graphics card to how, how to fill the, those pixels. So that's why a bunch of us uh, Back then, like started creating libraries and frameworks to that abstracts um, all that complexity. So, so developers and ourselves could stay productive uh, and focused. Uh, those libraries take care of placing uh, objects in 3D space, uh, material configurations, loading 2D and 3D assets, uh, interaction sounds, uh, etc. Like anything for doing any any sort of like game or application. Uh, the Sony designing those libraries. Uh, takes time, but over the years, uh, people have been doing like, pretty amazing uh, projects with them. Uh, so let's have a look at what people are doing today. So people are still doing uh, interactive music videos. That's good. <laughs> uh, in fact, like in this example, Track by Little Workshop uh, not only works on desktop uh, mobile, but it also works on VR devices, uh, letting you look around uh, while traveling uh, through like, glowing tunnels. Uh, another clear use of the technology is gaming. Chrome is a beautiful game developed by a surprisingly, surprisingly small uh, team and was uh, released uh, last, year's, uh, last year's Christmas experiment. Another one is uh, uh, web experiences. Uh, in this case, uh, Oh the Goat is an interactive uh, animated storybook uh, designed to teach children uh, about bullying. And the guys that. The folks at Assembly uh, used uh, Maya uh, to model and rig and animate uh, those characters and ex then export it to GLTF uh, via Blender. Uh, for rendering, they used 3JS, and they brought like 13,000 13, lines of TypeScript uh, to make the whole thing work. Uh, and yet another very common use 
is uh, product configurators. The guys I let a little workshop uh, again show how good this can look uh, in this demo. Click. Uh, but those those case, use cases do not end there. Like when people are doing like data visualizations, enhancing uh, newspaper articles, uh, virtual tours, documentaries, uh, movie promotions, and more. Like you can check. Uh, you can check the 3JS website and the Babylon JS website to see more of those examples. Um, however, we don't want to we don't want to end up like in a world where the only HTML elements uh, in your in your page is just a canvas stack and a script stack. Uh, instead, we must find like a ways of combining uh, WebGL and, and HTML. So the good news is that lately we have been like seeing more and more uh, projects and ex uh, examples of web designers. Uh, Utilizing bits of WebGL to enhance uh, their HTML pages. Uh, here's a site that welcomes uh, the user with a beautiful immersive image. Uh, we're able to interact with the 3D scene by moving the mouse uh, around the, the image. But after scrolling the page, uh, then we reach like traditional static layout with all the information about the, the product as, we, as traditional websites usually look like. Uh, the personal portfolio of uh, Bertrand Candace shows a set of developments affecting a uh, uh, dynamic background. It's a little bit dark. But, uh, with JavaScript, we can figure out the position of those developments. Uh, and then we can use that information to affect the f physical simulation that happens on this 3D scene on the background. Uh, but like for underpowered devices, we can just replace that WebGL scene with just static image, and the website is still functional. Another interesting trend we have been seeing is the uh, websites that use distortion effects. Uh, the website for Japanese uh, director uh, Tao Tajima has a very impressive uh, use of them. However, the, the content is actually plain and selectable HTML. So it is surprising because, as you know, like, we cannot do these kind of effects uh, with CSS. So if we look, if we look at it again, what I believe that they're doing is like they're just copying. They, they have the DOM elements that they're copying the pixels, all those elements into the background of WebGL canvas. Then they hide the, the, the DOM element, and they apply the distortion. They, they finish the transition, and they put the next DOM on top. So it's still something that you can enable and disable depending on the, uh, if it's mobile. It also works on mobile, some other things, but something that you can progressively enhance, basically. Uh, one more example. The site for, uh, this site applies the distortion effect on top of the HTML, basically making the, the layout like, flu like truly fluid. I, I, then again, like, this is something surprising because it wouldn't be possible with CSS. Um, so I think those are all great examples of the kind of results you can get by mixing uh, HTML and WebGL. But it still uh, requires uh, the developer to dive in, uh, into JavaScript. And that, you know, as, we, as we know, can be a little bit tedious to connect all the parts. Uh, if you're more used to, uh, to React, uh, this new library by uh, Paul Henschel uh, can be a great option for you. Uh, React Tree Fiber mixes React concepts on top of 3GS abstraction. So that, uh, that, like, here's the code that, uh, for the animation that we just saw. Notice how the like, previously defined uh, effect and content uh, components are easily composed into the canvas. Uh, it makes the code much more reusable and easy, much e and easy to maintain. Uh, however, I think that we can still make uh, even simpler. Uh, enter web components. Uh, I believe uh, web components uh, will allow us to uh, finally bring, bring all the power of WebGL right into the HTML layer. Uh, we can now encapsulate uh, all those effects in composable uh, custom elements and hide all, all the code complexity. So for example, here is another a project that we did for the WebGL launch eight years ago. Uh, it was kind of a globe platform. It was a, a, like a project that allowed uh, JavaScript developers to uh, visualize different data sets uh, on top of a globe. You have the library, you have your, your data, and then you have to uh, create like use different like, magnitudes of different parts of the data to display it. Um, 
but even if we tried to hide the WebGL code, uh, developers still had to uh, write custom JavaScript uh, for loading the data and configure the globe and append it to the DOM. And the worst part was like the developers will still have to handle the positioning of the DOM object and the resizing. And, and it was just difficult to like, mix it with like, a normal uh, SML page. So today, with Web Components, we can simplify all that code uh, with just those two lines. Uh, the developer only has to include the JavaScript library uh, on their website. And a powerful custom element uh, is now available to place uh, whenever, whenever they need uh, in the DOM. Not only that, but, like, but at that point, like duplicating a line, uh, with by, duplic by duplicating the line, they just can have like, multiple uh, globes. Before, it will, they will have to you know, duplicate all the code, and it will be, again, harder to like more code to read and parse. Uh, a component that is already ready uh, to use. The previous one is not ready yet. Uh, this one, uh, Model Viewer, is really ready. Uh, and for this one, basically, we wanted to do that. The problem is that displaying uh, 3D models on the web is still pretty hard. So we really wanted to make it just as simple as like embedding like an image in your page, like as simple as adding like an image tag. So that's the main, that's the main goal. Uh, for this one, again, the developer only has to include a, a JavaScript library. Uh, and, then, and then like a powerful disk, a custom element is ready to display like any 3D, 3D models. We're using the GLTF uh, open standard. Uh, an important feature of HTML tags is accessibility. Uh, for low vision and blind uh, users, we're trying to inform them uh, on both the 3D model, or, like what the 3D model is, and also uh, orientation of the model. Uh, here you can see that the view angle is being communicated verbally to the user uh, so they can be oriented with what's going on. Uh, and also, it prompts the, uh, for how they control the model with keyboard and, and an AC, an AC uh, exit back to the rest of the page. Uh, the model viewer also supports uh, uh, air, like uh, augmented reality. And this, you can see how it's, being, it's also re really being used uh, on the NASA website. So used by adding the AR attributes, uh, it's going to be able. It's going to show an icon, and it's going to be able to launch uh, the AR viewer for both on Android and iOS. For iOS, you have to include the USDC uh, file. And lastly, uh, while building uh, the components, we realized that uh, depending on the device, you can only have up to eight WebGL contexts at once. So. If you create a new one, the first one disappears. Uh, it is actually like a well-known uh, limitation of WebGL. Um, it is also good practice to only have one context for uh, keeping memory in one place. Uh, the best solution that we found for this was creating a single uh, WebGL context uh, off screen, so like it's hidden. And then we use, we use that one to render all the model viewer elements uh, on the page. Uh, we also like, utilize the uh, interesting observer uh, to make sure that we are not rendering objects that are not, are not in view, and also resize observer to whenever detecting either, either developer is modifying the size, we uh, re-render if we have to. Um, but we all know how the web is. Uh, sooner than later, someone will want to display hundreds of those uh, components at once, and that is great. We want to allow for that. Um, but for that, we'll need to make sure uh, that the underlying APIs are as efficient as possible. So for that, uh, now Quarantine is going to share with us uh, what's coming up in the future. All right, thank you. OK, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, this was an amazing display of what's possible on the web using GPUs today. So now I'll give a sneak peek of what's coming up next in the future, where you'll be able to extract even more computational power from GPUs on the web. So hey, everyone. I'm Corentin Valez. And for the last two years at Google, I've been working on an emerging web standard called WebGPU in collaboration with all the major browsers at W3C. So WebGPU is a new API that's the successor to WebGL. And it will unlock the potential of GPUs on the web. So now you'll be asking, Corentin, we already have WebGL, so why are you making a new API? The high level reason for this is that WebGL is based on an understanding of GPUs as they were 12 years ago. And in 12 years, GPU hardware has evolved, but also the way we use GPU hardware has evolved. 
So there is a new generation of GPU APIs in native, for example, Vulkan, um, that help do more with GPUs. And WebGPU is built to close the gap with what's possible in native today. So it will improve what's possible on the web for game developers, but not only. It will also improve what you can do in visualization, in heavy design applications, uh, for machine learning practitioners, and much more. So for the rest of the session, I'll be going through specific advantages or things that WebGPU improves over WebGL and show how it will help build uh, better experiences. So first, WebGPU is still a low-level and verbose API, so that you can tailor the usage of WebGPU to exactly what your application needs. This is the triangle Ricardo just showed. And as a reminder, this was the code uh, to render this, that triangle in WebGL. Now, this is the minimum WebGPU code to render the same triangle. As we can see, the complexity is similar to WebGL. But you don't need to worry about it, because if you're using a framework like 3 or Babylon, then you'll get the benefits transparently for free um, when the framework updates to support WebGPU. So the first limitation for that WebGL frameworks run into is the number of elements or objects they can draw each frame, because each drawing command has a fixed cost and needs to be done individually each frame. So with WebGL, an optimized application can do a maximum of 1,000 objects per frame. And that's kind of already pushing it. Because if, you're on, if you want to target a variety of mobile devices and desktop devices, um, you might need to go even lower than this. So this is a photo of a living room. Um, it's not rendered. It's an actual photo. But the idea is that it's super stylish, but it feels empty and cold. Nobody lives there. And this is sometimes what it feels looking at WebGL experiences, because they can lack complexity. In comparison, game developers in native or on consoles are used to, I don't know, maybe 10,000 objects per frame if they need to. And so they can build richer, more complex, more lifelike experiences. And this is a huge difference. Um, even with the limitation in the number of objects, WebGL developers have been able to build incredible things. And so imagine what they could do if they could render this many objects. So Babylon.js is another very popular 3D JavaScript framework. And just last month, uh, when they heard we were starting to implement WebGPU, they're like, hey, uh, can, we get, can we get some WebGPU now? Um, and we're like, no, it's not ready. Like, it's not in Chrome, but here's a custom build. And um, the demo I'm going to show is what they came back to us with just two days ago. So can we switch to the demo, please? All right, so this is a complex scene rendered with WebGL. And it tries to replicate what a more complete game would do if every object was drawn independently and a bit differently. So it doesn't look like it, but all the trees and rocks and all that, they're uh, independent objects and could be different objects. So in the, corner, in the top, left, uh, top right corner, there's the performance numbers. And we can see that as we zoom out and we see more objects, the performance starts dropping heavily. And that's because of the relatively high fixed cost of drawing each object, of sending the command to draw each object. And so the bottleneck here is not the power of the GPU on this machine or anything like that. It's just JavaScript iterating through every object and sending the command. Now let's look at an initial version of the same demo in WebGPU. And keep in mind, this was done in just two weeks. Um, so as the demo. As the scene zooms out, we can see that the performance stays exactly the same, um, even if there's more objects to draw. And it, what's more, we can see that the CPU time of JavaScript is basically nothing. Um, so we are able to use more of the GPU power, the GPU's power, because we're not bottlenecked on JavaScript. And uh, we also have more time on the CPU to run our application's logic. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, what we have seen is that for this specific and early demo, WebGPU is able to submit three times more drawing commands than WebGL and leaves room for your application's logic. A major new, uh, a major new version of Babylon.js, Babylon.js 4.0, was released just last week. And now, today, the, uh, the Babylon.js developers are so excited about WebGPU that they are going to implement full support uh, for WebGPU, for the initial version of WebGPU in the next version of Babylon.js, Babylon.js 4.1.
But WebGPU is not just about drawing more, uh, more complex scenes with more objects. A common operation done on GPUs are, say, post-processing image filters, for example, depth, depth of field simulation. We see all this all the time in cinema and photography. For example, this photo of the fish, we can see the fish is in focus while the background is out of focus. And this is really important because it gives the feeling that the fish is lost in a giant environment. So this type of effect is important in all kinds of rendering so we can get a better cinematic experience. But it's also used in other places like camera applications. And of course, this is one type of post-processing filter, but there's many other cases of post-processing filters, like, I don't know, uh, color grading, image sharpening, um, a bunch more. And all of them can be accelerated using the GPU. So for example, the image on the left could be the background behind the fish if before we apply the depth of field. And on the right, we see the resulting color of the pixel. What's interesting is that the color of the pixel depends only on the color of a small neighborhood in the original image, in a small neighborhood of the pixel in the original image. So imagine the grid on the left is a neighborhood of original pixels. We're going to number them in 2D. And the resulting color will be essentially a weighted average of all these pixels. Another way to look at it is to um, see that on top, we have the output image. And each of the, the, the color of each of the output pixels will depend only on the 5 by 5 stencil of the input image on the bottom. The killer feature of WebGPU, in my mind, is what we call GPU compute. And one use case of GPU compute is to speed up local image filters like we just saw. And so this is going to be pretty far from DOM manipulation uh, like React or like amazing web features like course headers. So please bear with me. We're going to go through it in three steps. First, we'll look at how GPUs are architectured and how an image filter in WebGL uses that architecture. And then we'll see how WebGPU takes better advantage of the architecture to do the same image filter but faster. So let's look at how a GPU works. And I have one here. So this is a package uh, you can buy in stores. And uh, can you see it? Oh. oh, yeah. So this is a package you can buy in stores and a huge heat sink. But if we see inside, there's this small chip here. And this is the actual GPU. So if we go back to the slides, this is what we call a die shot, which is a transistor level picture of the GPU. And we see a bunch of repeating patterns in it. Um, so we're going to call them execution units. These, ex these execution units are a bit like cores in CPUs in that they can run in parallel and process different workloads independently. If we zoom in even more in one of these execution units, this is what we see. So we have in the middle a control unit which is um, responsible for choosing the next, next instruction, like, for example, add two registers or load something from mem main memory. And once it has chosen an instruction, it will send it to all the ALUs. The ALUs are the arithmetic and logic units. And when they receive an instruction, they perform it. So for example, if they need to add two registers, they will look at their respective registers and add them together. What's important to see is that a single instruction from the control unit will be executed at the same time by all the ALUs, just on different data, because they all have their own registers. So this is single instruction, multiple data processing. So this is the part of the execution unit that is accessible from WebGL. And what we see is that it's not possible for ALUs to talk to one another. They have no ways to communicate. But in practice, GPUs look more like this today. There is a new shared memory region in each of the execution units where ALUs uh, can share data with one another. So it's a bit like a memory cache in that it's much cheaper to access than the G main GPU memory. But um, you can program it directly, explicitly, and have ALU's shared memory there. So a big benefit of GPU compute is to give developers access to that shared memory region. This was the architectures of GPUs and their execution units. So now we're going to look at how the image filter in WebGL maps to that architecture. 
for remainder, this was our, the algorithm we're going to look at. And in our example, uh, so since our execution units has 16 ALUs, we're going to compute a 4 by 4 block, which is 16 pixels, of the output in parallel. And each ALU will take care of computing the value for one output pixel. And this is GPU pseudocode for the filter in WebGL. And essentially, it's just a 2D loop on x and y that fetches from the input and computes the weighted average of the input pixels. What's interesting here is the coordinates argument to the function is a bit special because it's going to be pre-populated for each of the ALUs. And it's what will make it so that's what will make that ALUs each do in a, an execution on different data, because they start populated with different data. So this is a table for the execution of uh, the program. And likewise, we can see the coordinates are pre-populated. So each column is the registers for one of the ALUs. And we have 16 of them for the 16 ALUs. So the first thing that happens is that the control unit says, hey, initialize sum to 0. So all of them initialize the sum to 0. And then we get to the first iteration of the loop in x. And each ALU gets its own value for x. Likewise, each, uh, each ALU gets its own value for y. And now we get to the line that does the memory load of a value of the input. So each ALU has a different value of x and y in their registers. And so each of them will be doing a memory load to a different location of the input. Let's look at this register, uh, at this ALU. It's going to do a memory load at position minus 2, minus 1. We're going to get back to this one. So if we go an, and do another iteration of the loop in Y, uh, likewise, we update the Y register, and we do a memory load. What's interesting here is that the first ALU will do a memory load in minus 2, minus 1. That's a redundant load, because we already did it at the last at the last iteration. Anyways, the loop keeps on looping, and there's more loading and summing and all that that's ha that happens. And in the end, we get to the return. And that means the output, uh, the sum will get written to the output pixel, and the computation for our 4 by 4 block is finished. Overall, the execution of WebGL on the, of the algorithm in WebGL for a 4 by 4 block uh, did 400 memory loads. Uh, the reason for this is we have 16 pixels, and each of them, each of them did 25. So now this was how the filter executes in WebGL. We're going to look at how WebGPU uses the shared memory to make it more efficient. So we take the same, shader, uh, the same uh, pr program as before, so th it's the exact same code. And we're going to optimize it with shared memory. So we introduce a cache that's going to load, that's going to contain all the pixels of the input that we need uh, to do the computation. This cache is going to be in shared memory so that it's cheaper to access than the actual input. It's like a global variable that's inside the execution unit. Of course, uh, we need to modify the shader to use that input tile. And because the input tile needs to contain values at the beginning, uh, we can't just start like this. So this, is, this function is going to be a helper function that computes the value of the pixel. And we're going to have a real main function that first populates the cache and then calls the computation. So like the previous version of the shader, the coordinates um, are pre-populated, so each of the ALUs does a different execution. Um, and then all the ALUs work together to populate the cache. And there's a bunch of loops and whatnots there, but it's not really important, so I'll spare you this. What's interesting to see is that only 64 pixels of the input are loaded and put it in the cache. There is no redundant memory loads. Then we go to the main computation of the value. And likewise, um, this is very similar to what happened before. But on this line, the memory load is now from the shared memory instead of the main memory. And this is cheaper. So overall, thanks to the caching of a tile of the input, the WebGPU version didn't do any redundant main memory load. 
So for a 4x4 block, it did 64 memory loads. And like we saw before, WebGL had to do 400. So this looks very, um, very biased in favor of WebGPU, but in practice, things are a bit more um, mixed because WebGPU did, uh, didn't do ma main memory loads, but it did a bunch of shared memory loads, and it's still not free. And also, WebGL is a bit more efficient than this because GPUs have a memory cache hierarchy, and so some of these memory loads will have hit the cache that's inside the execution unit. But the point being, overall, WebGPU will be more efficient because we explicitly are able to cache input data. So the code we just talked about, in the graphics world, it's called an image filter. But if we look at the machine learning world, it's called a convolution, a convolution operator. All the optimizations we talked about, they also apply to convolutional neural networks, also known as CNNs. So the basic ideas for CNNs were introduced in the late 80s, but back then it was just too expensive to train and run the models to produce the results we have today. The ML boom of the last decade became possible because CNNs and other types of models could run efficiently on GPUs, in part thanks to the optimization we just saw. So we are confident that machine learning web frameworks such as TensorFlow.js will be able to take advantage of GPUs to significantly improve the speed of their algorithms. Finally, algorithms can be really difficult to write on GPUs in WebGL. And sometimes, sometimes they're just not possible to write at all. The problem is that in WebGL, where the output of computation goes is really, really constrained. On the other hand, GPU compute that WebGPU has is much more flexible because each ALU can read and write memory in, at any place in the GPU memory. This unlocks a whole new class of GPU algorithms from physics and particle-based fluid simulation like we see here to parallel sorting on the GPU, mesh skinning, and much, much, uh, many, many more algorithms that can be uploaded from JavaScript to the GPU. So to summarize, the key benefits of WebGPU are that you can have increasing complexity for just better and more engaging experiences. And this is what we have seen with Babylon.js. It provides performance improvements for scientific computing, like machine learning. And it unlocks a whole new class of algorithms that you can offload from JS CPU time to run on a GPU in parallel. So now you're like, hey, I want to try this API. You're in luck. The WebGPU, group, uh, the WebGPU is a group effort, and everyone is on board. The Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari, they're all, all starting to implement the API. Today, we're making an initial version of WebGPU available on Chrome Canary on macOS, and other operating system will follow shortly. To try it, you just need to download Chrome Canary on macOS and enable the experimental flag unsafe WebGPU. And again, this is an unsafe flag, so please don't browse the internet with it on for your daily browsing. Uh, more information about, about WebGPU is avail available on webgpu.io. So there's the uh, status of implementations. There's a link to some samples and demos, a link to a forum where you can discuss WebGPUs. And we're going to add more stuff to this with articles to get started and, and all that. What we'd love is for you to try the API and give us feedback on what the pain points are, what you'd like the thing to do for you, but also what's going great and what you like about it. So thank you, everyone, for coming to this session. Um, Ricardo and I will be at the web sandbox for the next hour or so if you want to discuss more. Thank you. Thank you.